welcome to the 2022 uh, Musa Smart City Practicum final presentations. Um, I'm Michael Fitchman, uh, the interim director of the MUSE program. Matt Harris, who's my co instructor um, in this class this year, are much of our course and some of our clients and faculty are live in the room, which is very nice to see after what has been a very trying year of experimenting with going back to school in person, among other things. Um, but let me introduce to you uh, the practicum class. Um, this is the fifth year for the Smart Cities Practicum, um, where we build five to six client-based studios um, built around data science um, and public policy decision-making and use cases, operations problems. So things that are not run-of-the-mill applications of data science and machine learning, where these are frequently tools that you see in the private sector, people are trying to optimize um, some kind of algorithm in, in finance or uh, in marketing or something like that. We're much more concerned with trying to take the tools of our era and turn them towards positive social purposes. And much of doing that involves bringing together understanding from a variety of other fields and thinking about the, the really serious risks and challenges associated with doing this kind of work. Thinking about how there are real people behind the data and there are um, real consequences for getting it wrong. And uh, this, this class is the um, capstone to a year long or for people who do dual degrees, two to three year long arc of learning how to do this kind of work. And uh, it's incredibly, incredibly gratifying to be able to have these presentations uh, in person. It's really my faith that one of the things I've missed the most uh, over the last two years is um, being able to congratulate all of you for a job well done and welcome you into the field as a professional colleague. So it's very special for me to um, be doing this here with you in person rather than over the computer. Um, so I, I also want to, um, uh, before we talk about the schedule, I want to give a special thanks to um, all of our clients. So we, uh, we start this process in about, I mean, after this ends, I'm going to start thinking about next year. I mean, I've already been thinking about it. And there are um, many people from across the country who have, so graciously given their time and their data and their advice to us to do projects that in many cases are pretty experimental. We, we try to take a bunch of metal and throw it off a cliff and, and agree that we're gonna build a flying machine before the end of the semester. And um, our clients put a lot of uh, trust in us and they're very, very helpful and integral to what our students are doing. So. Huge thank you to all of our clients, um, especially those of you, Jonathan Piles in the room. I, I know Jason Jones from uh, Guilford County is on the Zoom, who've been working with us for a number of years. But each and every client has um, has has my enormous gratitude. Thank you so much, and, and I hope that the results and the process have been pleasing to you. So let me tell you about the um, run of show for today. Um, we're in that first bit there, opening remarks, and then we have six groups, um, and I just have them listed here by their, their client names, but um, each project uh, is distinct in its own way, and um, we are going to start with our City of Philadelphia group, and followed by our group from um, Colorado Springs, Colorado, for US Ignite, and then we have two groups um, from Gilbert County, North Carolina, working on different projects, different use cases. Um, we'll take a break and then we'll get into uh, projects from um, Philadelphia Legal Assistance and the city of El Paso. Um, and at the end, we'll try to say some words to summarize uh, what was done here and give you good wishes uh, as you go out to the main event, which is the graduate graduate picnic that happens in noon. So um, 
Thank you again for those of you who are joining us and those of you who have helped, have helped us. I'd like to turn the microphone over to our first group, uh, City of Philadelphia Parks and Recreation. <clears throat> My day can I come up? Okay. And, um, and so I want to give you some information on, on the format. Uh, groups will give presentations of approximately 15 minutes and then we will have uh, 10 minutes for questions and answers and we'll, we'll try our best to uh, monitor the Zoom and be able to relay these questions to the people um, on stage. Uh, so bear with us with any, for any difficulties. Um, I'd like to ask uh, as a group that you please make sure that you um, uh, speak into the microphone so that we, uh, the people on the Zoom can hear. You know why it's yes, got it. Um, so let me share the whole screen. Hey, good morning. Um, we're the group that worked with the Philadelphia Parks and Recreation Department uh, this semester. Before we begin, we'd just love to shout out the team there. We met with many mem members of the Parks and Recreation Department throughout the semester, and especially Andy and Bill that helped us work through the data and figure out, um, help us set direction for this project. We're really grateful for their time and energy and thought leadership. Also, thank you, um, Michael and Matthew, for your guidance as well. And I want to start with the end. Um, what you're seeing on the screen is a map of Philadelphia and all of the parks and recreation facilities around the city. There's over 500 of them throughout the city. And imagine you knew, imagine you were someone working within the Parks and Recreation Department and had to make decisions about uh, what programs were to take place at each of these different facilities what data might be useful for helping them make those decisions? And what if you had access to information about how people were traveling to parks and how people were traveling around the city? You click in to one of these uh, census block groups, a little area of the city. You can see here that there's some information about which parks we believe people in this group are most likely to visit. Here it's saying the um, John McVeigh Recreation Center, there's a 22% likelihood of people visiting. And you can use this information to interpolate up to how many numbers of people would be visiting each of these parks. This is some of the work that we did with the Parks and Recreation Department. And throughout our presentation, we'll walk through how we got to this point. Um, but let me step back and switch over to the presentation. Thank you. So our presentation is called Better Programs, Better Parks, Improving Programs and Visits in Philadelphia Parks and Rec Facilities Using Safe Draft Data. And we'll talk about what Safe Draft Data is in a little bit. We're going to walk through the introduction, uh, an example of a specific use case. We're going to talk about a Huff model, um, which is a type of uh, data science model that we built uh, and for the first time ever applied it to parks and recreation data. And then we'll come back and look at that dashboard to finish things out. So I already mentioned this, but the Philadelphia Parks and Recreation Department has 524 facilities throughout the city, uh, ranging from everything from pocket parks up to the Wissick and Valley Park and everything in between, including recreation centers. And at those facilities, the team is responsible for um, pr programs, uh, around 4,000 programs annually. They have a staff that's responsible for helping carry out these programs. 
programs range from everything from sports to arts and crafts to after school care, so a wide range of activities. And so our objective in working with the team at PPR is to help their team think about how to schedule program activities by understanding visits and understanding where people are already traveling in the city and what parks and recreation facilities they are visiting. We can think about things like how many visits, where these visits are coming from, when the visits happen throughout the day. And just to help you understand like the world of PPR, um, because this was, there's a lot of, uh, a lot that we had to learn early on. The way that they think about the city is it's divided up into 10 districts. You can see those all the way on the left. Each of those districts are further subdivided into service areas. And each of those service areas contain facilities. At those facilities, there are programs like after school, athletic, camp, cultural. And there are people working at PPR that are making decisions about which programs to host and which facilities within their given district. Okay, now let's go to the second part, the use case. So how does a PPR official schedule programs? In the business as usual, a PPR official will refer to the historical schedule and even count the garbages to have an understanding of the total visits so that they can have some guidance to do the scheduling. But right now we propose a new way to use the safe graph data to have an even more better understanding of our total visits so that they can allocate the programs more accurately and more effectively. So what is safe graph data? Um, basically, we can understand it as the location data collected by the safe graph device panel. For example, in January 21st, uh, there are around 90,000 these devices in Philadelphia. And these devices are distributed in every central global group. For example, there are 34 devices in this central global group. So each device will collect information about the uh, user location and the daily footprint. And this information will be further aggregated to, into the pattern data. So this is the uh, um, example of the pattern data. For example, uh, for the specific location design school, from January 1st to, to January 5th, uh, there are 10 visits in total in the devices panel. And among these 10 visits, five of them are from central group one, and three are from central group two, two are from central group three. And the pattern data will also include information about the dwelling time, the visits by day, and the visits by hour. But one thing you be notice is that um, this information could not be used in further analysis unless we do some scaling. And the scaling will be based on the number of the population, the number of the third party devices in each central group. And in the description section, we will give a pretty detailed example about the scaling. But right now, let's, let's assume we do the scaling. So after scaling, we can use the pattern data to answer a lot of questions. The first one will be for each facility, where do people come from? For example, for the Charlie Street Villa playground, people are mainly from these central groups. Uh, each board group will have more than will have more than two thousand visits in the past year. And the top three communities are A Street, Chinatown, and uh, Villa House Square. So the second application will be to inspect the current program allocations. We will use the k-means to identify the relationship between the demand and the supply for each park origin and month. The demands here means the visits. So the supply here means the progress. And after the clustering, we find out there are three main relationships between among the data. And they are over progress, potential, and normal. Over progress here means the number of visits is kind of small, but the number of progress is kind of large. And potential means there are many visits, but the number of progress is pretty small. And normal is just normal. So this is a geospatial distribution of the relationships in October 2021. Um, what we need to be noticed is that as the time changes, the demand and supply will change. So the relationship will also change. So every month we will have a different re relationship map. And there are 273 village parks can have progress. But in the past year, there are only 36 of them had progress. So these are the 36 points on the map. Okay, let's uh, see a special case on the facility which has the high uh, visit count but low programs. Christy Rec Center is a neighborhood facility in District 8 uh, with, uh, with, with, high, with high visit and low programs. 
There are only 33 programs scheduled in the last year, which are soccer games and after school activities. But based on the SIFGRAPH data, they record, uh, it recorded uh, more than 300,000 uh, visit counts on the last year. And uh, uh, the after school activities were held at 3 p.m., while the soccer games uh, took place in the evening every Monday and uh, Friday in autumn. Uh, but the aggregated uh, SIFGRAPH data told us most people come between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. and stay uh, longer than one hour. So let's see, let's uh, overlay the, um, and the daily visit counts from the SIFGRAPH data to the programs of the last year. We can see there are several peak um, values of visit counts that show up in March, May, June, and August. But the programs are scheduled in autumn. So there's a lot of potential to optimize the programs and to meet the demand when the pickup value show up. Here come more questions. How shall we do the optimization? How many additional programs are needed? Which programs should be removed and will the relocation affect other sites? By reviewing the allocation and checking the conflicts, we can refer the half model to adjust the number of programs uh, and predict the updated probability that the people, uh, the visitors will choose the park as the destination. So um, with, with the updated number of, um, of the programs, we can get the uh, range of the visitors um, will go to this park. So by testing the different allocations, uh, we can find a uh, we can find a which schedule will make a balance between the supply and the demand. Then that's the optimized uh, schedule program. Program. Let me hand over to Sean for more details of the half model. So um half model um yeah. So what is half model? Let's look at an example. The people is deciding which park they should go. They should go river park or the Bisahake and Valley Park. And these two parts have many characteristics in many aspects, like in the area, the program, and driving distance. So for example, the school, the school river park is kind of closer to the user and you had a program, but it's kind of small. And on the other side, the Vitatica Valley Park is kind of huge. You can hang out a whole day there. So how do people decide? Under this scenario, the half model will be a tool to predict the probability of a visitor visiting a site. And it's a function of the distance and attractiveness, et cetera. So to get a predictive probability, we need four inputs into the model. The first input will be the attractiveness of parks. We collect multi-dimensional information about a park from the area to the number of picnic tables and to the number of programs and their correlation with the visitors up at this on the right side. And the second variable will be the neighboring attractiveness. We use the attractiveness of the convenience store of this variable. And the reason we use convenience stores is that we believe people are more likely to go to the parks where they can finish the daily shopping on the same time. And so the red dots on the map are the location of the convenience store, the gray area are the facilities of PBR. And the three variable will be the distance. In the example, we see the distance is a key factor in deciding which part we should go. So to input the distance metric into the model, we calculate the combination of each park to each central group in the Philadelphia. And we know there are 273 parks in Philadelphia and more than 1,300 uh, uh, central groups. So it's a huge calculation. And the fourth variable will be the frequency level. Um, the, the value of the frequency level are assigned based on the observed historical probability. For example, for example, for the central group one to the, uh, to the parts to the center three, the observed historical probability is from 0.3 to 0.1. So in, in this scenario, we assign a median of the frequency level. We will repeat this process to each record. So um, and in, in the model optimization process, we find out that this variable really helps a lot in improving the prediction accuracy and uh, 
and uh, and we decreasing MAE. The reason why it is good at this because we assume it is because um, it kind of accounts for the intergroup variance. The intergroup here, I mean, the different frequency level. So once we got the all the variance, we can see input shown just introduced, we could combine them with the visit probability that derived from the safe graph records. And then we can train our HEP model with this data, uh, trying to borrow experience from the past and identify the underlying relationships between the input features and the target values. We ended up with a HAP model that can forecast the visit probability. And we could use the visit probability to further calculate the market area and the number of visits. As I said, there are two important final result metrics that PTR can leverage to make decisions. That is market areas and the number of predicted visitors. Let me explain more about the market area. So, for example, if I live in this census for group 01, 02, 03, and I happen to be a park lover, the probability for me to visit the park A will be 40%. And in this case, my census for group will be the primary market area for park A. And similarly, in this case, my, my block group will be a secondary market area for park B, C, D, E. Uh, after we built up models for each census block group, we obtained a complete market area for the for all parks in PPR's program list. And we can visualize the market area as a map like this. So in this map, the market area for each park share the same color with the park itself. The darker the color, the greater the market share in that region. Let's come back to the case we mentioned before. Uh, this Albert Christie Lake Center is a potential site, which means uh, it has room to be improved by PPR by assigning more programs here. So after we identify it as a potential site, PPR might decide to increase its program number that they will assign here in the future. So uh, then the attractiveness input and the probability output in the model will also change accordingly. At the last step, the, the half model would tell um, PPR the new visit prediction and the new market area. And if this result is not satisfying enough, PPR could just repeat this whole simulation process until reaching a satisfying balance. And then how well does our model work? Uh, we, pre we build up one model per census block group. So totally there are over 1000 models in our program. And the average R squared score is 97%, which means there are 97% of the variance in the target value has been explained. That is pretty good. And we also evaluated our model with another metric, MAE, which stands for mean absolute error. And the average MAE here is 0 0.028. Uh, and we'll, if we check the MAE with the frequency levels, you can see in this diagram, as the root visit frequency level increases, the error actually declines, which means the model are more accurate for the frequently visited routes. We can also conclude this with um, the we, we can also conclude this by aggregating the accuracy in different spatial units. For example, in the left map, when we aggregate the prediction errors in the residential block groups, colors are lighter in those in those sensor residential block groups, which means um, our model are more are more accurate for those sensor residential areas. Similarly, in the right map, when we aggregate the prediction errors in the PPR facilities, um, colors are lighter for those large parks, which means the models are more accurate for those large parks. So at last, we did the spatial cross validation to test the model generalizability. Um, in the left map, it displays the error, the prediction error 
of the before Ottoman Ottoman of Ottoman like model. And you can see colors are very dark and very dramatically among different PPR districts here, indicating that this model is not generalizable. So we took root visit frequency level into consideration. And then we got our optimized model, which is on the right side. You can see the cross validation error here is way more small and close to each other among different districts, which means we, the model become more generalizable and make it, make it possible to move forward to our next step, optimizing the health model in the web application. Awesome. So we crunched a lot of numbers, we did a lot of science, and at the end of the day, we were able to identify uh, facilities with around the city where we might want to increase the number of programs and decrease the number of programs. Um, in addition to all of the data science work we just walked through, we also built this dashboard here. So the dashboard, um, I know we don't have a lot of time, so just to go through it quickly, um, gives a uh, employee of the Parks and Recreation Department, the ability to actually see this data and visualize and interact with this data throughout the city. So we could dig into a specific district like District 7 and see the parks facilities within that district. We could look at a specific facility. Using that safe graph data, we can see where people are coming from throughout the city to get to that facility. But perhaps um, one of the most interesting and most experimental parts of this dashboard is the ability to interact with and adjust the Huff model directly, um, like Lana was just describing. So to zoom in on a specific part of the city, we can go into West Philly and look at Malcolm X Memorial Park. We can see that uh, there's 55 programs um, at this park. Um, and this is, again, this is like the actual results of the HUP model. This is a simplified version of it, but still a HUP model. And we can see as we click on each block group, the percentages in this block group is a 51% chance likelihood that people will go to Malcolm X Memorial Park, which makes sense because it's close by. But as we come farther out, we can see it drops to like 6%. Um, just by way of example, if we click on Malcolm X Memorial Park, we have the ability to um, adjust the program count because that's one of the things, one of the uh, variables that's helping them determine these probabilities. So let's say we increase this from 55 to 80 and update map. You can see the HUD model just automatically recalculated this block group actually right above it. Um, it just became the primary destination rather than a secondary destination. Um, and just to be really dramatic, let's go from 80 to 100, 800. We can see Malcolm X Memorial Park becomes much more attractive in West Philly when we start to really ramp up the number of programs there. So this gives the staff the ability to experiment with uh, how they reallocate programs throughout the city and uses our data and the model that we built to do so. Anyway, thank you for um, listening to our presentation. Thanks again to the team at Parks and Rec um, and to our classmates and their professors. Um, I really enjoy getting to work with this data and uh, hopefully make our parks better. Thank you. We have two questions from Andy at Parks and Rec. Um, I, I'll well, Andy might be able to actually say them on screen. Sure. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much to the team. This is really incredible work, and it, it fills a gap that we've never been able to do in terms of evaluating how we program the city. Um, I just worry about the, the four attributes of the model and how they were weighted. So I shared that, you know, we, obviously location is an important factor for park usage, and that's pretty, you know, common sense among your park professionals. Um, but like neighborhood attractiveness, that's, a, that's new to me. So I'm wondering sort of how those maybe inform the model, if they've informed it equally or, or how you might have weighted them differently. Um, the weights, uh, we obtain the weights by training the model using the historical data. So, do we have the equation here? 
and you have to get too technical. I'm just wondering. To, so you had mentioned that location was an important factor, even you saw. Did yeah. you use that? Did you weigh that more heavily? Um, so the thing that I say is important because it's um, how the part that is um, exponents in the denominator. So uh, the changes in the distance will highly influence the whole probability outcome. Yeah, and yeah, I think it would be easy if we have we, we can handle that equation. So sure, that that's fine. And then and then I was also wondering about um, if if we were to run this again next year, do you think that would improve the model accuracy? So if we were to use twenty twenty two safe graph and twenty twenty one safe graph data, and then the program data from both years as well, how do you think that would affect the model? And is that Party recommendation. I think they will definitely uh, improve the model because uh, when we are doing the project, we find out one one thing that we, we think is difficult to do is that we uh, we don't have much data, so um, the time lag variable could not be included in the model. So if we can have the time lag uh, variables, and the the model will, will definitely uh, improve a lot. And also when we do the um, OLS for each of the block group, we find out some groups that may have a uh, very very few data points. So if we have a two year data, so the data points will be enough for us to train the model more better. And this is the equation that I just mentioned. So you can see the D, uh, the D, D stand for distance, and it's kind of, yeah, uh, D stands for distance, and A is Japanese, and C is the centrality. So we can see D in the, the denominator will highly influence. Um, impact the whole probability outcome. And in fact, it, it did, yeah. Do you have any other questions? I think we should move to uh, our next group. Andy, um, do you have any, do you have a follow-up to that or shall we move along? No, thank you so much. We really look forward to using the, the dashboard and can't say thank you enough. So thanks a lot team, really appreciate it. Okay, we have our team from Colorado. Um, by the way, I want to mention that Huff model project from Philadelphia, that's that's never really been tried before, which is, it was quite a roller coaster trying to figure out how those models could be used with these data and how those models could be used in my use case. So I want to give a lot of credit to the students for trying something that there's no roadmap for. Okay. Yes. Turn the lights down in front. Okay. All right. So I'd like to turn it over to a group um, whose client is US Ignite. Um, who should I be handing this to first? Here you are. Thank you. Good luck, then. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are the team. Uh, yeah. Well, we're the team uh, working uh, with US Knights uh, for the Army Base for Colorado. We designed a mobility system support system uh, to aid uh, base operations. Uh, my name is Nanjing Shi. Uh, this is Bing Chu Chan, uh, Shiming Tu, and Zheng Zhang Shu. And uh, our team is guided by the uh, sorry, the clients at US Knight, which is part of and Cloud Content. We are grateful for the support and for the guidance of this whole project. And obviously, also great for Michael and Matt for mentoring us this process. Uh, so let's begin with talking about uh, what we're looking at. Uh, so Fort Carson is one of the largest U.S. Army garrisons in the United States. Uh, since 1942, it's located just south of Colorado Springs, uh, which is along the front range in Colorado, the most populated area in the United States. Um, it's very huge. It's almost 140,000 acres. 
you can see the population. Um, while officially in the census, the population is counted as 13,800 uh, uh, population residents. Uh, the associated population, which includes uh, retired army members, veterans, um, you know, su support staff, and all their families, uh, comes to almost 125,000 people. And this is actually 26% of the population of Palo Springs proper. Um, and so you can see this is a very, very huge um, entity we're talking about, and, and one that I think that um, really, um, you know, uh, constitutes a lot of the large employers that you would see maybe in a lot of urban areas in the U.S. Next slide. Um, Fort Carson is also very integral to the overall transportation of Colorado Springs. Uh, you can see that in the city plan, um, it's identified as a major transit center for um, not only transit, but also the general, um, you know, highway network that uh, we see uh, pervades around Colorado Springs. And if you look at Fort investigation, you can see that Fort Carson uh, takes in a lot of origins uh, from all over the city as well, and it's also reflected from the data we see um, as well. Um, and so our main question that we're trying to solve here is the question of travel jam travel congestion. Um, obviously, there are major factors to this, but um, the results that we can see immediately um, from looking at four parts specifically are that it is also a huge generator and recipient a lot in a lot of um, traffic demand, uh, traffic demand and traffic congestion um, going to this specific network. Um, you can see that frequently, even that this one section of I-25 along the eastern side of the base, that there are almost 2,000 traffic jams that came up period, and there was a 97% chance that you wouldn't be jammed here. Um, and so what we really have here um, is the institutional problem, where we have one major employer um, that um, does suffer a lot. Their, their employees, uh, they suffer a lot from, from uh, getting to and from the base. There's an opportunity here to improve traffic from safety, uh, specifically through monitoring uh, the gates that surround the base, because this is obviously a chip access facility. Um, uh, operators at the base are are, are enabled to uh, really uh, control the flow of traffic through opening and closing these gates around certain times. And this will um, this is really the basis of what we're trying to ultimately aid in. Uh, we are trying to predict uh, traffic emission levels that surround the base in order for the base operators to have a better understanding of where they can manage flow themselves for their own operational decisions. Um, this will ultimately improve the whole network and ultimately uh, the metering the meter security as well. And so our proposed solution will be to um, have a real time prediction analysis and network network for Fort and Colorado Springs in general, and then feed that to Fort Carson uh, context. We are going to send a maps and alerts to predict traffic disruptions in real time to end users. But at the same time, we that model as well for the base operators to inform their own decision making um, on weather related and also safety related traffic uh, based collision and safety directions. So, to better illustrate how our web application works, um, that's imagine a scenario together. Suppose you're one of the decision makers in Fort Carson. It's a drowsy afternoon and you can sound the rain in the air. It's three in the afternoon, which means the rush hour is coming close. And you start to worry. Um, if it rains, it's probably gonna worsen the traffic condition. So, how congested is the traffic now in the city and around the base? Um, you look at a map and see the congestion is currently distributed very unevenly across the city, with some locations having as many as six jump counts in the past hour and some with no jump counts at all. But, however, around the base, everything seems just fine. It cheers you up a little bit and you think to yourself, how nice it would be if it remains this way in two hours. So what does the data tell you? You slide the button to the upper left and see that the congestion situation in two hours um, is going to even improve. Although the hotspots moves from the northwestern parts of the city to a location that is directly to the north of Fort Carson. You click on hotspots on the map to, kick, to, to take a closer look. Um, this location seems to be going through some traffic surge from the past two hours, and it seems like a normal surge since it aligns well with our historical data. The data tells you that in two hours, the jump condition um, in this location is going back to its normal low level. Oh, okay, before we forget, let's um, look at what's the traffic condition around the gates and see what you can do to help. You click on the gate number on the left panel and examine each of the gates on the map. 
The summary statistics under each of the gates make it so much easier for you to do your job because now it takes less than two seconds for you to spot any unusual jump level around the gates. Hmm. That's, there's no jump around the gates now, and there won't be any jump level. Uh, there won't be any jumps in two hours. What like is that? <laughs> So um, how does this amazing app come to be? Overall, we went through uh, three stages, uh, which will also be the order from the rest of our presentation. First is the um, data exploratory analysis. Uh, we use a temporal lag and spatial lag of our um, jump data from waste of weather data, crash pattern, and electricity usage. And the second stage is the model part. Um, overall, we transform our raw data uh, to a Haskell level time panel, and we use several machine learning tools such as a rigid, random forest, and an FK boost. So our web application is built upon all the efforts we put into the first stages. Um, it, may, it uses the three data set we produce, which is the historical traffic data, the real time traffic data, and the two hour predictions we have. Okay, now I'm heading over for an exploratory data analysis. I will walk you through the first part of exploratory data analysis. And our main data set here is waste traffic data in 2021. In this data set, each row is a jam record uploaded by users. It contains information like location, delay time, and current speed. For example, this is one traffic jam on I-25 in October. And we can get the current speed is 15 kilometers per hour and the jam length is about 600 meters. So it looks like a severe jam. So what factors might be associated with traffic jam? The first and probably the most obvious one is time. We aggregate the data by time and calculate the average number of traffic jams. Each part here is a jam in a week. We noticed that there is strong periodic time patterns throughout the week, both daily and weekly. So jam count is increasing along the weekdays and decreased on weekends. Well, in a single day, increasing uh, peaks are obvious and such periodicity appears throughout the year. So to predict jams, the data in the past is very important. Another factor that might also be associated with traffic jam is location. So what is the uh, spatial pattern of traffic jams? We plot a map of jams on 12 and 1 p.m. in a day. As you, make, as you can see, there are more traffic jams near the downtown area. And most importantly, the spatial lag is significant, which means nearer traffic jams are more related. For example, at this point, you can see that the uh, jams shift to the west from 12 to 1 p.m. So in the model, we are also going to uh, try to engineer this spatial lag. People may feel inclement weather, are all, like green days are always accompanied by small traffic jams and the longer delay times. And based on the traffic data from October to December in 2021, it is a fact. And based on the bar chart on the right, it could be found different types of inclement weather corresponded to different number of traffic jams. That indicating weather might be correlated to number of traffic jams. And we build linear regression models between number of jams and the wind speed at each hour. And we also plot each uh, regression model slope. It could be found that wind speed and number of jams are positively related to at noon because the slope is larger than zero. While the wind speed and number of jams are negatively related because of a minor slope. So we can speculate that the relationship between weather and traffic will change with the time of day. So based on this plot, we add another new weather variable, which is, which is in the format of weather plus time of day, 
for instance, green speed and PM or AM. It can represent an interaction effect between weather and the time. Here we compare the situation of, of October 1st, which is a rainy Friday to the average situation of all Fridays. The October 1st is represented by a dashed line, while the average situation is represented by a solid line. Those gray areas are rainy hours. Based on the plot, we could find that the average hourly number of congestion in several hours after rainy was still much higher than usual, indicating that inclement weather has lasting effects on traffic. So we add another new type of variable, which is in the format of weather plus time lag. For, for instance, rainy plus two hour lag. It can take lag effects of weather into consideration. Here we are looking at the hexagon level crash distribution in our study area. We divide the yearly we divide, we divide the yearly crash data into five quantiles, where there are some safety incidents happening on local roads. The most affected areas are the state and interstate highways. The blue points on the edge of Fort Carson base signify its six gates. On roads where crashes are relatively rare, the location of gate is always, is always the area where crash cluster, clusters. And we also explore how electricity changes over time. Electricity shifts a cycle that correlate with jam level. If we look at a red Monday, October 2021, we can see two peaks at around 10 in the morning and five in the afternoon, which falls into the morning and afternoon peak traffic hours. This makes electricity one of the best predictors in our model. And entering into the modeling part, we first use hexagon speech net as our spatial unit, which means instead of using the lines or points in the raw data set, we are aggregating it into many hexagons. This is because we can then model the spatial lag by considering nearby cells. It may cause some ambiguity though, but we try to minimize the cell size and we think that the spatial lag is worth the trade-off. The input of the model is transformed into a time panel and more specifically, the raw data, uh, as mentioned before, each row is jammed with time. So it is aggregated by hour into a full time series called time panel. So with the time panel, we can then model the traffic jams and give a prediction on every hour. We try different depend variables to describe jams, and we build several regression models, including ridge, lasso, random forest, and XG boost. The winner here is random forest with jam count as the dependent variable, and the R squared here is 0.22. In the model, we engineered four types of predictors with a total number over 50. The most important ones are on the left of the plot. So time lags are super strong. For example, the categorical hour and two hour time lag, followed by spatial lag and others. And there are also some very powerful weather encoded predictors. Like if it is normal weather in the middle of the day, if we take a look at our prediction over time, although our model seems not very good in terms of R squared, our predictions are pretty good. The row red line here is our prediction and the gray line here in the background is the actual value. So uh, the model successfully predicts most peaks and troughs, though it seems to be more conservative on the peaks, we are pretty happy with the results. We also plot the actual value against the prediction on max in a day. The overall trend is similar and the model successfully predicts uh, the top area of gems. So in summary, we designed this graph application for our decision makers in Fort Carson in their daily decision making process just to help them coordinate the traffic condition there. Um, our goal is to try to like do this coordination of traffic to avoid serious like traffic congestion and also 
uh, the potential safety risks following online quiz and weather events. So when we are developing this uh, web application, we're trying to answer three questions in general. So the first one, what is the jam level now um, in the city around the base? And the second, um, how is the jump level gonna be in two hours? And the third one is like, how is the jump level change like within a day? And also like uh, compare compare with the historical data. Um, yeah, so thanks again for our clients, um, Kyle and Paula for providing the data and also like patiently answering all our questions and thank Michael and Matt for their guidance along the way. And we're really enjoying working with everybody in this practicum. And thanks everyone for their attention. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have a question from um, Pollock, our client and also a new user graduate. Um, Paula, can unmute yourself and uh, feel free to chime in. Hi, everyone. A oh, great presentation, guys. I just had a quick question about um, how is electricity related to traffic? I really didn't get the electricity usage as a variable for traffic prediction. It makes sense that they peak at the same six um, during the hours of traffic because people are probably getting ready to leave. But uh, how is it directly related to traffic was my only question, I guess. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, we encountered uh, a paper that says the traffic jams and electricity usage might be somehow correlated. Uh, that is mainly because probably people will leave home and started to work uh, on the road. So maybe at that time, their electricity usage is lower and the traffic jam is uh, increasing. So uh, this is an interesting predictor in our model. I have a question. Yeah, for sure. why, why is the waste data better used in a hex bin than at the street segment level? Yeah, that's also a good question. So uh, we made some comparison here. And um, as we know, the road segment, uh, which is a, maybe the road data set, has better interpretation ability. But they have um, actually more data to process than the hex bins. So the modeling will be uh, easier if we use hex bins. And another uh, reason we use hex things is because the spatial lags, the spatial effect is then easier to model. Because if we look into a hex thing, for example, the hex down here, for example, we can take into account the nearby cells uh, and the next generation of nearby cells. So uh, this taking into account the, the, the neighbor, the cells, um, will actually model the uh, spatial lag, spatial effect. So we think it's a better way to do this. Uh, John. Yeah, um, I'm John Landis. I, I used to teach in the user program. Um, it's a really great presentation, very clear. Uh, and I, I really liked uh, the way you uh, 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 documented so many of your assumptions. Uh, for example, the use of uh, hexagons rather than line segments. And it really shows a, a level of, of, of clear decision-making, which is really terrific. I, I, I do have a comment and two questions. I, I, my comment is this presentation shows to me the strengths and weaknesses of sort of a machine learning approach. Uh, the strengths are uh, that you have a lot of data and you're able to integrate it into a model. And the weaknesses are the flip side of that. You have so many variables um, at least as I looked at your um, sort of histogram of variables, that you sort of really, uh, other than using sort of, you really sort of, it's not clear how they're interrelated and how they're working. And, and, and in some ways with this type of model, it's, it's often better to have a, a sort of a, a, a smaller model that's leaner and meaner because you don't have to worry about either collecting so many other different variables. 
uh, into the future, or that you have a clearer idea of what the interrelationships are between those variables. So to me, this is a wonderful example of both the strengths and weaknesses of these sort of large data machine learning model. Uh, along those lines, I really appreciated your efforts on exploratory data analysis, and I have two questions along those lines. Uh, the first was, uh, do you think there's a relationship between weather and crashes? I certainly do. Um, and I wonder if you investigated that in your exploratory data. Do different types of weather cause a higher incident of crashes? And the second thing, um, in the uh, tra traffic safety, uh, uh, crashes are known to be stochastic events, which is to say, an individual one is not predictable, but seen over a large term, they follow um, uh, some broad spatial patterns, some broad distributions. Uh, and when people are trying to reduce uh, both crashes and reduce traffic, they try and model the uh, tra uh, uh, traffic on uh, 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 crashes and stochastic events. So I guess my only two questions, great presentation, are what's the relationship between crashes and weather, and how did you think about modeling crashes going forward? Um, these are great questions because we definitely ask ourselves. I'm sorry, could you speak up a little bit or put the mic a little closer? Thanks. Oh, like this? Yeah. Okay. So I just want to say like, thank you for these questions because these are really great questions. We definitely asked ourselves along the way when we're building the models. Um, actually, we have done like several presentations already. And one of the presentations, we actually like um, show people what's the relationship of weather and crash. And it's actually really interesting, like it's intuitive to think that weather has something to do with crash, but actually there are like so many other factors affecting the crash. So when we are plotting out uh, the relationship between like different types of weather, like when it's sunny, like when the road is dry and when it's rainy, when it's snowy, and we plot it with against like a uh, what's the crash like numbers like that day, and we realize like it's it, the, the relationship between, between them is not really like linear. It's not like if it rains, it definitely have more crashes because there are like so many other factors behind it. And in terms of a second question, like the crash here, I would have to say like, it is not our priority to predict crash because this app is basically like um, more focused on the jam level, but we do use crash here as a like, um, features an independent variable because uh, we all know like if there's a crash um, like happening somewhere, it's probably gonna cause the jump in that area. So we assume like this relationship exists. So we put like uh, the historical crash data as a feature into the model. And yeah, I hope I explain myself clearly. Well, those, are, those are really good responses. Yeah. If any of you are thinking this, uh, taking this further, I would encourage you to, um, you might look at some of the work the Traffic Safety Center at Penn State has done because mm -hmm. they've really been a leader in sort of in sort of understanding all these complicated relationships and coming up with different model specifications that are more stochastic and cue based than necessarily regression based. I'd like to thank you for this question, Joe. I think it's a fantastic question. Um, I'd like to give our last question for this group to Kyle Kyle Compton from the US Ignite. Kyle. Yes, and um, I want to uh, reiterate Pollock's appreciation. Um, I thought this team did a really great job clearly presenting all this information, laying out their assumptions and uh, fielding our you know requests and our guidance uh, very well when we met. Um, and I think this table is even answering my question. Um, one one idea that we've had as we've been you know working with our Arctic, clients on this is the idea that there would be a strong relationship with lagged weather um, and congestion or traffic safety. Uh, the idea is, um, you know, if it was just rainy and previously cold, you know, maybe now that's a proxy for the roads being icy where we don't necessarily have that road condition data. Um, and I'm seeing it's kind of hard to read different weather lag temp variables in this table. Uh, so did that idea play out in the data? Did you investigate that? Uh, yes, I believe uh, in the data you can see that although we've categorized much of the purple ones as weather, that uh, we have basically lagged a lot of the um, 
whether it accounts to or towards a more like on the hourly basis as well, um, in addition to the regular time lags that we already have. Um, because it's all obviously, you know, it's a space time model that we can, you know, retake this in either the space or the time dimension. And both of those could be very significant uh, when it comes to these events. So, uh, yeah, I think that that was done in some cases. Um, it's obviously much more accessible for some weather. I think the rain was the rain and the wind were the two most obviously factors that I think, although they're limited in some cases, that I think they're maybe the most significant. Thank you very yeah. much. Resources, I'd just like to add that if you're interested in pursuing this line of questions about crashes and prediction further, you should refer to uh, Ryerson, Long, Fitchman, Harris et al. from Accident Analysis and Prevention from the Center for Safe Mobility right here at the Weissman School of Design. So, um, obviously important questions and people are on the case. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to our, our next group, our first of two groups from Guilford County. Our hope is that um, we're running generally on schedule right now, so we should be able to take a five, five, ten minute break after this group but before the next. So here you are. Good luck. Hello, everybody. Uh, today, uh, myself, Jonathan Clemente, along with my partners, Olivia Scalora and Jolly Yao, will be presenting to you our Human Resources Intelligence System for Guilford County, North Carolina. Before we start, we'd like to uh, offer a, sh a huge thank you to the, the Guilford County team, Graham, June, David, uh, Jason, and Sherry especially. Um, we'd also like to thank our MUSA faculty members, Michael, Matt, and Jumbe. Um, our music classmates, especially for all the help that you've given us, and especially Dr. Ken Stipe, um, without whom we would all not be here. Right on. So um, we'd like you to meet Jane. Um, Jane began working for the Guilford County, North Carolina, uh, Guilford County, North Carolina Social Services in 2003. Um, and when she started, she was making about just uh, under $30,000 a year. Over the next four years, Jane was given five minor raises, and by 2010, she made about $45,000. However, after 10 years of being employed with the county, Jane left her position with social services in 2013 for work elsewhere. Now we would like you to meet John. John was about 28 years old when he began his uh, position with social services in 1999, and he was making about $55,000 a year. John has held this position with consistent pay raises for about 22 years and is still actively employed with the social services department today. Both Jane and John have experienced growth throughout their tenure with Guilford County. So why is it that Jane decided to leave and John did not? Both Jane and John, oh, excuse me, we know that an employee's satisfaction with their, uh, with their position at a firm has many different layers. How long have they been employed with the firm and how many promotions have they had in that time? Is there opportunity for personal and professional growth? And what is their work-life balance? Finally, what is their compensation package? We also know that firms invest precious time and money and energy into training their workforce. On average, it costs about $15,000 to find and replace an employee. Each employee holds with them institutional knowledge that is crucial to the organization functioning effectively. And when an employee leaves, they take with them that knowledge and the impact of their departure is felt not just during their absence, but during training their successor. Currently about one quarter of Guilford County's workforce is in a state of turnover. And this high level of vacancy has pushed existing employees to take on more responsibilities in addition to hiring and training the new employees that come. So our first challenge is to define what our independent variable is. Our ultimate goal is to detect when an employee is at risk for leaving employment voluntarily. So using uh, county human resources termination reports, we've categorized each termination incident into voluntary and involuntary. 
A voluntary turnover looks like someone leaving work for other employments, returning to school, uh, moving with the spouse, and uh, no longer reporting to work. While involuntary termination um, looks like an employee not meeting job expectations, disciplinary action, uh, position elimination, and reorganization within the county. And we also distinguish these termination incidents as separate from employees who finish their tenure with retirement. So as Jonathan mentioned, we're examining three different windows for turnover prediction. This is going to be 18 months, 12 months, and six months. So for example, if an employee quits in February of 2013, we can look at details of this individual's employment 18 months ahead of the turnover event to identify uh, the red flag of voluntary turnover risk. This might look like a pay raise or a pay cut or a shift in the department demographics. We can also assess which factors uh, have the most impact on employees deciding to leave their positions voluntarily. So because our predictions are so time dependent, exploring our data begins with examining trends of county employment over time. The count of total county employees has been steadily decreasing over the course of our study period, which is from 2006 to 2022. In 2006, Guilford County, according to our data, had just over 1,100 active employees, while in January of this year, the count was at just under 800. We can also see on the plot in the bottom that the count of voluntary turnover has this interesting normal distribution over time, and there is a peak in voluntary turnover that occurred in 2016 with a, or with a total of 154 observed voluntary turnover events that year. So while voluntary turnover has since decreased from this peak, so has the active employee count, and the county still has this high position um, vacancy rate. So we hypothesize that employees with shorter tenure are more likely to leave voluntarily as opposed to employees with long tenure. According to the Work Institute's 2019 turnover report, over one third of new employees quit within one year or less. So we test this with our, with our data by categorizing tenure by number of years employed. The plot on the top illustrates each employee's employment timeline from hire date to termination date, and we categorized each timeline by their turnover type. So the timeline of employees who voluntarily leave employment, which are presented in yellow, are strikingly short in comparison to voluntary and retirees, uh, excuse me, involuntary and retirees. And then the graph in the bottom confirms that lower tenure categories correspond to higher voluntary turnover rates. This graph tells us that employees who stay less than one year, one to five years, and five to 10 years leave employment voluntarily at rates over 50%. So in agreement with our hypothesis, as tenure increases above 10 years, voluntary turnover reduces and retirement becomes much more likely. And next, we hypothesize that employees whose salary is under the market rate for their job position are more likely to leave the county for other work than employees who are paid at least the market rate salary for their position. The market rate value for each salaried position uh, is sourced from Guilford County HR salary data. So the plot on the left tells us that about 75% of employees that are paid above the market rate finish their tenure with retirement, while the plot on the right tells us that the majority of employees that are paid below the market rate leave voluntarily, which also confirms our hypothesis. So lastly, we hypothesize that an individual's experience in county employment will be heavily influenced by the department under which they're employed. So we plot the relative turnover type by function group. Um, each function group will have multiple departments that fall underneath it, and viewing it this way gives us an idea of which groupings of departments have historically um, had more occurrences of voluntary turnover and might be at greater risk for voluntary turnover in the future. Um, we can see from this chart that community development, health, parks and recreation, and services all stand out over 75% of um, terminations being voluntary in the past. So to dive a little bit deeper into department relationships with turnover, we engineered a few features to understand how employees' relative position um, or demographic within their department will affect chances of leaving voluntarily. So first, we calculated the age group for each department at a given point in time. If an employee falls within the average age group for their respective department at that point in time, they're classified as majority, and if not, they're minority. So when we explore how this variable relates to observed voluntary turnover over time, 
um, we look at the proportion of relative age for each year. So the plot on the top, you can see that every year since 2010, a greater proportion of employees who left voluntarily were not in the same age group as the majority of their coworkers, indicating that this variable will probably be pretty useful in our predictions. And then we repeat this process for relative gender. You can see that the plot on the bottom, um, that between 2011 and 2018, over 75% of voluntary turnover occurred from employees who were the minority gender within the department, which is pretty significant. So we apply the same logic um, to relative race, marital status, pay raise, and we get a whole new set of dynamic and significant features to feed our predictive model, which uh, Jolly will talk about next. As for our prediction performance, we've considered various of elements that would affect the employee's turnover status. After testing several hypotheses, we used 17 features to predict the turnover status, including employees' personal information, like their age, gender, ethnic origin, uh, whether they smoke, and their work information, like the commute time, pay rate, and is this employee the majority gender in the department, etc. And our model can correctly identify 81% of employees who left and 62% of employees uh, who stayed active. And the overall accuracy is 72%. And um, the purpose of the county where a company used a model like this to predict and, predict and intervene to keep a valuable employee is to avoid the business impact that turnover brings. So under such context, the cost and benefits analysis is important. The cost and benefits analysis is based on the confusion metrics, which represents four types of the outcome, com, um, four types of the outcome of our predictive model. Our model has two possible outputs, voluntary and active. Here we said voluntary to be the positive event, active to be the negative event. Um, I'll explain these four situations in the context of our case. As you can see on the right is the basic information of the turnover cost and the stay interview cost. Keeping the value of all employees is maintaining the existing assets of the, uh, of the county. So the county will not be generating any revenue from this process. Um, so we won't have the benefits part of this analysis. The goal here is to, uh, is to reduce the cost of the turnover. Um, the true negative means the employee is active and we also predict this person as active. So no action taken, hence no money spent. And the false positive at the bottom of this table um, means we predict the employee will leave and we give the person a steady interview but the employee actually has no intention to go. So the only cost here is the stay interview, which is $14. Next, we will focus on the model's correct prediction of a turnover event versus its inability to identify a turnover event. True positive means we predicted a turnover conducted a, a stay interview. For this situation, first, we need to answer a question. How effective is the state interview? Let's suppose the success rate is 80%, which means there are still 20% of the interviewees would leave after the intervention. So for those 20%, their part of the cost would be 20% of their average salary and the cost of the interview. For the other 80%, the cost is $14 each. False negative means we predicted no turnover, did not conduct a stay interview, but the employee left. This would be the worst scenario. We just let the employee go without any, uh, without any information. So the cost would be the most. So we want this situation to show as less as possible. So um, by balancing these four situations, we can adjust our model accordingly to make the cost to make the cost the lowest. Mm -hmm. um, for further uh, cost and uh, benefits analysis, 
So we still need to answer these questions. What is the success rate of the state interview? How many state interviews can be conducted in a week? If active employees are asked to have a state interview, will they doubt themselves and potentially generate the idea of leaving? Are there any other intervention methods? And how much do they cost? Does the state interview cost more than just purely time cost? And finally, um, is our dashboard. All right, so we want you to step into the shoes of our client. Uh, so let's just take Graham, for instance. Graham, on an everyday basis, uh, part of his everyday tasks, needs to figure out who he's going to reach out to to conduct this stay interview process. Um, so what our dashboard is going to do is help Graham I both identify the trends that are occurring in the county level and the department level, but then also hone in on a, an employee uh, so that he can reach out to them to conduct that stay interview process. So um, the, the information that will be presented to Graham first and foremost will be how many employees are, are uh, actively working with the county, the number of employees that we predict um, will turn over in the next 12 months, um, and the potential cost of this turnover. Down below, um, he will be able to interact with the, the different trends across uh, uh, the department levels. Um, so here in this, this figure, we're seeing uh, the temporal trend of turnover um, in each, uh, each department. Um, so here I'm highlighting health because it's evident that the health department and its subsidiary departments um, has, have experienced high rates of turnover. Graham can also zoom in on different windows of time here. Uh, so let's say he wants to look back uh, five or six years. He can also look at the, uh, the total employee count, the average age of those uh, employees in that department. And we see here that we're generally getting older, um, an average salary and total salary, therefore. Um, then once he has identified the, the, the department that is most at risk, or that he wants to target first, uh, he can then go down and start identifying the employees in that department that are most at risk of turnover per our model predictions. Um, so we've identified health as uh, our uh, department of concern, um, but for instance, you can tab over to law enforcement and the other departments here. Um, now let's say that we wanna find one of the more risky, uh, the, the, the individuals that are most at risk in the health department uh, of turnover. So we'll go ahead and filter uh, by the, the risk score there. Um, and we'll take note of their employee ID so that when we go over to the employees tab, um, we can go down here and type in 784 and identify, uh, I think I got the number wrong, but um, I can, all right. We can also, this way, just click over and it'll take us right there. Um, so what this information provides to, to Graham um, is the, the uh, information about that in individual employee so that he can prepare for a stay interview process in which he's gonna approach this employee um, and try to get them to stay with uh, Guilford County. And then um, if he needs to go back and look at our report and, and really dive into the details of that, he can do so on, on this page as well. So with that, we'd like to thank you for your time and, and offer up for, for any questions. First off, I just want to say that was just phenomenal. Um, we have time for two, our, our, your clients have a couple questions. I do want to make a note, those are not real people. Yes, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have signed, we, are, we have signed dated use agreements and uh, we made up a bunch of fake people in the public facing yeah. stuff. So
those on the Zoom, yeah, we com completely synthetic data for the, the dashboard. Data. That's right. Um, so uh, I would like to offer the floor to um, our colleagues from Gilbert County. Graham? Hey, uh, good morning. And first, I just want to thank everybody that worked on this project. Um, you're really great to work with. And, and uh, the conversations we had were really eye opening for us, too, as it kind of caused us to reflect. Um, so I just have a couple quick questions. The first one would be, were there any factors that you looked at that you did not use um, that you thought you would? Um, and then on the flip side of that, are there any factors in here that you did use that you didn't really think that were going to be a factor uh, that ended up being something to consider? Um, unfortunately, due to uh, temporal constraints of the um, employee evaluation data, we didn't have an opportunity to include those in the model. Um, for those of, uh, of you in the audience, uh, the county provided us um, granular evaluation data for each employee, uh, for, for, for most employees rather, from about 2015 up until today. Um, Unfortunately, though, that, that temporal constraint didn't match up with um, the more robust data that we were presented with, which were from 2006 to 2021. Um, so, you know, in, in future iterations, it would be great to be able to bake those uh, employee evaluations data into, into the model uh, and, and take into account how an employee is being evaluated. Yeah. And these variables that we have are basically very um, objective, their age or their job a title. But we also want to uh, include more variables that are subjective, subjective to the employees, like their satisfaction for their current job and their satisfaction for their work environment. Um, like like some survey data, but we don't include uh, right now. Um, Graham, do you have any additional questions? Or June? I don't. Okay. Uh, someone from the floor have a question? I think there's time for one more before we take our break. John? Well, I always have a question about if other people do. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I, that was a great presentation. I, I, and by the way, I thought the dashboard was terrific at the end. It's it's the sort of uh, information that would really be useful to a manager, um, the, the concise way the probabilities were shown. That was very nice. I, would, I just want to follow up on, on Graham's it, it, um, point. Um, if you had done this in the private sector instead of the public sector, you probably would have used a well-established tool called Six Sigma that was pi pioneered in um, the 1980s and 1990s. I don't know if you read about it. But it, it, it attempts to look at each, um, each uh, in this case, employee's contribution to the agency achieving its mission. So instead of just looking at how they rated in their job performance, which it does, it sees highly rated. It also says, well, you know, one of your fictitious people is really doing a great job for the company as it tries to achieve its mission. Do you think that sort of information would be useful? Because what a company tries to do is keep those high-performing employees who are basically making the most profit for it. Um, do you think that sort of private sector calculus would be useful here? I'm just curious. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure like how that would impact the model, but I'm sure it'd be incredibly useful information for at least the HR people to understand. I mean, it, it would be very interesting to see how it impacted the model. It's just, um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's, that's a great point. I haven't heard about that. I, I think the one thought that comes to my mind uh, when you ask this question, and thank you, thank you very much for, for asking the question, um, is the, the problem that the county is really dealing with right now is a, a, an unsatisfactory level of employment. You know, they're trying to keep em uh, keep employees there, whereas the on the private sector side, you're more trying to optimize for your best employees. Um, you know, we, we, to put it bluntly, maybe we just need bodies in the chair to to help people um, with the things that they need to do at the, at the county level. Um, 
all that said, uh, it, it would be extremely interesting to, to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you much. We're going to, we're, as is our custom, we are approximately 10 minutes behind, which means that um, I think, does anyone have the exact time? 10 30. Okay, you, you say it's 10 30? Yes. Yeah. All right, so at 10 40 Eastern, we will reconvene for our next presentation. I want to give a round of applause to uh, Guilford HR Group. I really think that was amazing. amazing. And, and if there's anybody from, you know, who wants to give them six figures to work at your um, major, major consultancy, uh, they're on the market. So, okay, we'll convene after a 10 minute break for our second Guilford County group um, at 1040. hear you anymore um or it's a lot of the background noise
well, there's the other places across the street. Next door to the Second of our groups from Guilford County, North Carolina. And I want to especially thank um, Jason Jones from Guilford County, who's been a partner of ours for maybe three or four years now. And um, I do want to give a very special thank you to um, the head of emergency services in Guilford, Jim Albright, who's uh, been very busy through all the public health crises that have gone on this year and has, has graciously lent us so much time and expertise. Uh, to this next group. I also want to thank uh, Hannah Bonstrew, who unfortunately can't be here due to um, illness, but it will be presenting um, on video. But uh, Hannah has done a great job as the departmental um, administrator for uh, New Star Student Administrator. And uh, lots of what we did this year was, was possible because of Hannah's help. So thank you, Hannah. And I'll turn it over to the team. Thank you, Michael, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us to learn more about our practicum project, which is about predicting structure fire risk in Guilford County, North Carolina. My name is Marlene Zink, and I'm joined by my classmates, Bree Cervantes, and as Michael said, uh, Hannah Bonas Drew, who's joining us via Zoom. And again, we'd also like to give a huge thank you to our client, uh, Guilford County Emergency Services, for partnering up with us to make this happen. Uh, specifically, we'd also just really love to thank uh, Director Jim Albright, as well as uh, Jeff Boyers and Todd Puddle for all their help throughout the semester. And of course, we'd love to thank our teaching team, um, Michael and Matt for all, and um, Jube for all the Zoom calls and knowledge that they've shared with us throughout the semester. And we really couldn't do this without any of them. So to get started, um, I would like to introduce the main questions that we set out to help uh, Guilford County Fire Division explore. Um, and those questions are, where is structure fire risk in Guilford County, North Carolina? Where are the resources? And are they in the same place? And these questions are particularly challenging for the county to answer given their complex fire district boundaries, which you can see on this map. Um, these fire districts and fire stations don't actually align with any of their city or town boundaries. And they even, as you can see in these areas over here, they even extend beyond the county boundaries themselves. And a lot of the fire stations um, and departments often help one another. And so all of these nuances make for a really complicated resource allocation process, especially because the resource allocation process is currently based off of property taxes rather than demand, actual demand for fire services or risk itself. Uh, so our, real, our question here is how can the county actually know whether each district is receiving the level of service it really needs? And in the long term, the county has expressed that they would like to consider moving to a more standardized approach for um, their resource allocation known as um, a standard of cover. And standard of cover are a systematic way to determine resource allocation given, uh, specifically with fires, um, given demand, capabilities, and the needs within a community. Um, so, but in order to get to that point where they can create those standards of cover for the entire county, they first must begin to understand three things. Uh, risk, needs, and demand in the county and their own capabilities as a fire division. And our goal is to help them understand and visualize risk, um, needs, and demand. More specifically to do that, uh, what we've done is we've created a fire risk web application for the county so they can be equipped with a deeper understanding of where there's exposure <laughs> to um, risk of structure fires so that they can make more data-driven decisions about their resource allocation process. 
And before we dive into exactly how we created this application, I'd first like to have Hannah show you all the app so that you can see exactly um, how the county can explore both fire risk and fire resources. Thank you, Marlena. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing my screen. Hopefully you all can hear me okay and um, see me all right or uh, see the app, I mean. Um, and so like Marlena said, the goal of this project was to give Guilford County the resources to um, look at where fire risk is and also compare it to where their own current um, structure or structures and resources are in place. So for our app, um, the county uh, can look at predicted risk. They can filter it for, this is, be non-normalized, but you can filter it for different variables. Um, right now we're looking at just the non-normalized risk um, broken into low, medium, and high. And then you can um, overlay uh, different variables associated with each district. Um, so we can look at the budget, for instance. Um, and based on this, we see that uh, Gibbonsville uh, Gibsonville has the lowest budget of all the districts. So if we want to check out what's going on in Gibsonville, we can go um, zoom in to this. And we see that Gibsonville has a low budget of only $14,481, but has pretty high um, predicted risk. Um, and then finally, what really makes this app um, we think a useful tool for the county is that they'll be able to download a PDF report um, of different scenes on the map um, in order to make their findings very shareable. Um, we hope that this is a tool that they can use um, in meetings um, or for their own exploration um, on how to best allocate resources. Um, and so now passing it off back to my team in the room um, uh, who will explain how we got here um, for this final product. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, so going back to how this all works, um, we, you know, how, how does this work and how is it different than other tools that explore risk? Uh, as some of you may know, because it seems like I'm joined by a lot of people who appreciate maps and data, you're probably, um, you know, of the understanding that there are tools out this, um, there are tools out there like this um, that can predict risk or like help us look at risk across a county um, or an area. And that traditional methods um, like this are often kernel density or heat mapping uh, to predict where future fires might be uh, based on past fires. But our approach is a little bit different. And first I want to make a quick note about our study area. This is particularly a note for our client. Um, so setting out to explore risk across uh, Guilford County, we needed to better define our study area due to some data constraints that we had and to address what we talked about earlier with the challenge uh, posed by the 19 fire districts, which extend beyond county lines. So as a result, we focused our study area to Guilford County's official county boundaries and we also removed the city of High Point. So that's the little cutout you see on the left. And going back to why we chose the method that we did, our method on the right, um, which is the risk modeling method, shows um, risk as a function not only of previous fire events, but also exposure to risk factors. And fires are pretty difficult to predict because although, and you know, we can't like quite pinpoint exactly where they're gonna happen, but we can use this method to look at exposure to these risk factors across the county, and that can allow us to expose areas of latent risk or hidden risk uh, that previous fires alone don't always have the power to reveal. And latent risk really uh, paints a more detailed picture of fire risk. It incorporates environmental and social factors that are associated with fire events. And some of the main data sets that we used to incorporate these factors were a data set of structure fire locations, county zoning data, and commercial um, occupancies, expect inspections, and violations. And on a per structure basis, this allowed us to know whether or not there had been a fire, um, whether the structure itself was commercial or residential, the value and size of the structure, and much more. And it's critical to incorporate this uh, kind of intelligence about fire risk, especially in this context where fires are so rare. 
And so less than 1% of all the parcels in our study area have experienced a fire. And the fact that fires are rare in Guilford County is not uncommon, but it does pose a significant challenge for accurately modeling fire risk. Um, so we took, we then took that parcel data uh, and we aggregated it. Because we wanted to understand fire risk generally across the county, we took our study area and split it up into fixed units of space. We applied a fishnet approach that has been used in similar projects in order to divide our study area into uniformly sized grid cells. Given both the size of the county and the fact that fire is a rare event, we decided on a grid cell size that captured an appropriate amount of structures and fire events. This ended up being a quarter mile by a quarter mile grid cell. We then aggregated all those features from our data set to each grid cell. For some features like building value, we took the median value for each grid cell. For others like inspection violations, we counted the number of violations in each grid cell. In aggregating the data to the grid cells, we found that some of them didn't have any structures in them. And because we were, our goal was to estimate future structure fires, we were only interested in areas where there were structures. So we removed those cells. And then to be able to better compare the characteristics of one cell to another, each of our features was normalized by the number of structures present in the cell. By framing the story of each grid cell by density or the number of buildings in a cell, we were better able to understand its story. Additionally, many of the features required some transformation, to them we applied either a log or a square. One particular trend that Director Albright highlighted in one of our first meetings was that the majority of structure fires are residential. So this is something that we were able to confirm in the fire event data set and ended up being a pretty strong feature. Um, so our approach, because we are incorporating latent risk factors, is different than a the traditional kernel density approach. But we do recognize that past fires can offer a great deal of insight into what parts of the county are poised to experience fire. So to investigate whether fires are correlated or cluster in space and incorporate that intelligence into our model, we employed a statistical analysis um, called Moran's Eye. And here we show that indeed fires are related in space. They do cluster and form these hot spots. And that was one feature, a pretty strong one that we incorporated into our model. Um, our interpretation of this result is that the fires correlate, or I'm sorry, they cluster in the urban center of the county, Greensboro, simply because there are so many structures there compared to other parts of the county. So in addition to using the features we already presented in the data, we also developed some others uh, that helped us better understand the nature of each structure. In particular, there were interesting features in the commercial occupancy inspection data that we received from Guilford EMS that was not present for other kinds of buildings. So we sought to develop features for those buildings that were similar to those inspection data features, like recent sales, we thought might indicate a structure had recently been inspected. After this engineering, normalizing, and transformations, we ran through a series of variable importance models primarily random forest and lasso regression to identify our key risk factors. Some level of this was also accomplished in our iterative modeling process. And these variables are the top performers for our final model. So applying the information that our features gave us about exposure to risk, we developed a count-based or a Poisson model. We used five years of fire event data and six years of violations and inspections data, as well as general structure characteristics data from county parcel data sets to predict the number of structure fires that might occur within the next five years. We decided to apply a count-based model because it would offer more insight than the alternative logistic approach in which we would predict presence or absence of fire. By examining not only the presence of fire, but poss the, the possibility of many fires compared to few fires, we were able to more deeply understand risk. Our Poisson model also used XGBoost, which is a tree-based model type that has been shown to outperform many different kinds of models. 
After we calculated our predictions of structure fire per grid cell, we then classified each grid cell as high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And we'll talk more about that classification later. So additionally, because we were interested in building a model that would predict well for every corner of the county, we developed our model using spatial crop validation. Using the R package spatial sample, we applied an unsupervised k-means clustering model to identify six spatial clusters in our study area. Here are our uh, raw results. Uh, you can see predictions on the y-axis and observed fire count on the x-axis. So this is predicted number of structure fires per grid cell. This plot shows a nice and upward, bright and upward trajectory uh, of our predictions increasing as real fires increase, but they don't match perfectly. Our maximum prediction is only 14, while the maximum number of observed fires in a grid cell is 16. Ideally, our model would be able to identify areas of high, low, and medium risk with similar levels of accuracy. That means it would not be better at predicting medium risk uh, versus high fire risk. We can see in this plot that while our model is good at predicting low values, it's not as good at predicting high values. Here we show the comparison of where our model predicted fires to occur and where the fires actually occurred. Ideally, we would want our model to predict well no matter where in the county the prediction is being made. And that's important because we're talking about resource allocation for the entire county. So using a statistical test, we wanted to establish whether or not our errors clustered in space, or another way to say that, whether or not our model performed poorly in some parts of the county versus others. And in doing so, we did find some clustering of errors. Um, that's what this plot shows. The yellow spots are where we have hot spots of errors. And this approach is using uh, a prediction for our structure fires and the error associated with that, normalized by the number of structures in each grid cell. Uh, we did this because we know that both fires and possible errors in dense part of the county will be higher than fires and errors in rural parts of the county, simply because they contain more structures. Immediately, we can see that our errors are not necessarily higher in the urban center of Greensboro, where there are more structures. Nearly all of the hotspots are located in more rural areas. A few of the hotspots share some similar characteristics. The three we've highlighted here all contain mobile home parks, Two include areas where different land use types interface. And uh, these three also include track developments near water bodies, lakes, or streams. Uh, but ultimately, we want to know how our model performs to the status quo, which, as we talked about earlier, is a kernel density approach. Um, here we apply our classification scheme. We went with tercyles, that's breaking our predictions up into three equally sized groups. Um, and we did this because our client expressed interest in classifying risk as high, medium, and low. We should note, however, that classification in and of itself is an entire field of study. So we experimented with other classification schemes that you can read about in our markdown. This map shows where kernel density and our model have uh, identified varying levels of risk. And to better compare, uh, this plot shows the proportion of observed fires, so real fires, captured in different levels of risk for both our predictions and kernel density estimations. It is clear that while our model isn't perfect, it does perform better than the status quo kernel density approach because it captures more fires in high risk areas. Right. And so again, we just want to emphasize that fires are both rare and often happen somewhat by chance. So in that sense, it makes them inherently difficult to find trends and make predictions. And likewise, in our case, we were also working with data that was really never intended to be applied or joined together to do this kind of analysis. And so, for example, um, as Bree mentioned earlier, many of our errors were clustered. Many of our errors were clustered in areas with mobile home parks. And without more information, we're not sure if our model was just bad at predicting those um, for those areas, 
or there might have been some discrepancy discrepancy in how structure counts were calculated for mobile home parks in the parcel data set that we received from the county. And so as such, it's important um, that we you know, can point out some limitations in our process. So in addition to fires being rare, joining together data sets that weren't intended to work together did cause us to lose some information um, and therefore some of the volume in our data set. And although we still have plenty to work with, um, these events are rare, so it's really great to have as much information as you possibly can to learn more about the patterns. And, um, you know, finally, we added some information that, um, you know, for a future analysis and with more time that we have on our data wish list, that would be awesome to have. Um, but with all that said, many people do see limitations and let that stop them. And we really want to commend Guilford County for their desire to innovate and use their data in new ways, even if it wasn't ever designed for this. Um, instead of just sticking with the status quo, which a lot of people choose to do. And we're really excited for the county to continue to innovate, and we're really grateful to have been able to join the, in this process. Um, so again, we would just like to extend a huge thank you to Guilford County and our teaching team, as well as everyone here um, who have supported this project. And we're happy to chat with any of you about other questions, let you explore the app, um, or learn more about the data details through our markdown. Um, thank you. We have, uh, I think, five minutes for questions. I'd like to give the floor to Director Albright, who's joining us from North Carolina today. Yeah, so just a couple of comments. First, uh, we'd like to thank you for this opportunity. Brianna, Marlena, and Hannah did an incredible job. I had an opportunity to meet with them several times throughout the semester, uh, and I think they've highlighted a couple of the major issues that we have as well. Uh, you know, fire, uh, however infrequent, uh, has huge community consequence. And so, you know, uh, we want to reduce uh, the risk of fatalities uh, from fires. We want to also have continuity in our, our business operations within our community. So having this risk model, uh, I think, will be beneficial to us moving forward. I think the other part is that we're doing a lot of conversation around community risk assessments. Uh, you know, one of the comments made was about commercial versus residential. Uh, commercial properties are inspected, uh, so we have fire inspectors that are in those facilities routinely. Uh, residential properties do not. Uh, hence the reason that you see significantly higher fires in residential properties. They also don't have fire protection and early notification systems. But the ability to do some quantification of the value of fire protection, uh, I think, has tremendous value to us. And I think the overlay, particularly looking at departmental budgets and risk, uh, has some real advantages for us moving forward. Uh, and you demonstrated very well, particularly in the kernel data, um, the fire crescent that Greensboro Fire has addressed for decades, quite frankly, which uh, stems kind of from the east side of our city down to the southern portion of the city uh, in an area that was heavily commercialized and had a lot of uh, mill housing and et cetera. So very high urban density, very old structures, uh, mostly residential at this point. Most of the commercial properties have gone away. I think you also did an excellent job of highlighting the geopolitical boundaries uh, that are in every jurisdiction that you deal with. Uh, so I actually am responsible for coordinating 19 nonprofit uh, fire departments, as well as four municipal departments that also have contracts in the county as well. So, uh, you know, trying to make sure that there's equitable service across the county in some measure is probably one of the single greatest challenges that we have administratively. So no question specifically, great modeling, great interaction uh, throughout this particular semester, and I think really a, a phenomenal analysis in the end. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jen. Thank you so much. Um, so, we have um, a little bit of a tricky technical situation um, because uh, one of our colleagues from our, our students from our next group is uh, um, recorded a video because we were uncertain of the technical um, elements of today's presentation. Um, but I'd like to invite the Philadelphia Legal Assistance Group up here. And um, yes, as Matt mentions, the Guilford County has been, I think this is, we've done four projects with them. And likewise, Philadelphia Legal Assistance, I think this is our third project together. And um, so grateful for 
all these uh, collaborations that we've been able to extend over the years because I think we start to come to understand one another and we can build um, projects that are very unique in the sense that there's some technical understanding and also um, some trust on behalf of the clients to, to let us really play in the sandbox a little bit. Um, okay, uh, do you have, yep. we have the materials up? Okay, great. Right. I'd like to mention that we have a GitHub page for Music Practicum. All of this year's projects are up and you can look at the open source code uh, for each project, which allows these um, projects to be replicated. And some of our projects do in fact become replicated across various municipalities um, uh, through the years, especially some of our projects in, in Louisville uh, over the years, they've, they've done a good job spreading, spreading the word. Um, but you can check out the apps, you can check out the code, and you can check out, for example, the interactive um, story mapping products that you're going to see from our next group. Are you ready? Uh, yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we're the Philadelphia Legal System Assistance Assessment Tool for Adverse Possession Group. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank our clients, uh, Philadelphia Legal System. Uh, Andrea Bidwani and Jonathan Powell, who, uh, who is here, and we thank them for uh, taking the time to come. Uh, we would also like to thank Adam Butler, who gave us, who provided us with data and expertise, and also uh, the faculty here, uh, Ben, uh, John Cromer, Tom Daniels, and John Poe, whose help was uh, instrumental in uh, us uh, delivering our end product. Um, and I will also like to shout out to Alex Nelms and Jonathan Clemente, who helped us navigate uh, the zone impairments uh, parcel numbers world uh, at the beginning of the semester. And Madam Michael, of course. Uh, um, as uh, Michael mentioned, uh, our, our star, uh, star speaker, um, Max, will be here today, but he was kind enough to. Uh, Make a video for you to do so. Hello, everyone. My name is Max. My teammates are Jillian Zhao and Adrian Leon. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person with you all, but to hopefully compensate a little bit for my absence, I busted out my handy dandy podcasting mic <laughs> to make it feel like I'm right there with you. Um, our client is Philadelphia Legal Assistance. And I'd like to begin today just by giving them a huge thank you for their collaboration and for their time and energy in putting together this incredible project. I wanna to begin today with a simple question for you all to ponder. And that is, what do you see when you see a vacant lot? Perhaps you see an unused parcel. Perhaps you see an owner who's abandoned a property. Maybe you just see blight. Well, it may surprise you to learn that hundreds upon hundreds of these vacant lots in Philadelphia are in active use by the community in a whole variety of creative ways, including urban gardens, public parks, and side yards. And so although the majority of vacant lots are those things, as you might have thought, unused parcels, others of them are in active community use. And so the problem we set out to solve is that in recent years, the city of Philadelphia has been foreclosing on these vacant properties in bulk. And for those that are completely unused, this may not be a problem, but in many cases, uh, properties represent cherished community assets, including public parks, urban gardens, and side yards. And sadly, in many cases, neighbors who have tended to these properties in the owner's absence for years sometimes, often don't find out that they are up for sale until they've already been bought and sold. The solutions to this problem are really the ones being pursued by our client and other organizations like it. And they come in the form of existing policy solutions and policy reform, and in certain cases, novel legal claims. And without getting too into the weeds, and I'm sure I wouldn't do it justice, there are certain claims that are really interesting like adverse possession, which given a certain amount of criteria, neighbors can sometimes assert ownership over vacant properties that they've been tending to. 
So our role in this project is really a supportive one. And we visualize it in three prongs. The first is to explore the data on vacant lots in Philadelphia and to visualize them on the map. The second is to aggregate all that data on vacant lots to assist our client in weighing what possible legal and policy interventions there may be. And then thirdly, to design an algorithm and bake it into that dashboard to predict which properties are at greatest risk of sale and development so as to allow them to preemptively help neighbors and community members who might be in need. And so with that, let's dive into the data. So across all of Philadelphia, there are approximately 27,000 vacant lots, which means that the likelihood is that you've seen one, at least one, in your time walking through Philadelphia. And so it begs the question is, how did the property go from being vacant to ultimately being sold by the city in a, through a sheriff sale? And that is the property owners will often either abandon the property or for some reason will fail to pay taxes. That tax burden will accumulate over time and thus creating a lien on the property that the city can, is um, entitles the city to petition to foreclose in, on the property in court. And then finally to send that property to a share of sale. And so thus you can think about the prop vacant properties across Philadelphia that are at greatest risk is those that have delinquencies in their taxes. And approximately 27.5% of all vacant lots in Philadelphia are tax delinquent, which equates to around roughly 7,500. So 7,500 vacant properties in Philadelphia are at risk of foreclosure and share of sale. To make matters worse, uh, among these tax delinquent vacant properties, around 2,000 of them are subject to a private lien by U.S. Bank, held by a private financial institution known as U.S. Bank. And I won't get too much into the municipal history of Philadelphia, but suffice to say, back in the late 1990s, the city sold a bunch of liens to U.S. Bank, entitling this private institution to go in and unilaterally foreclose uh, on properties. And to date, uh, there are approximately around 2,000 of these left. We can also understand just how great the risk is to vacant properties by how many of these vacant properties ultimately have been sold in a sheriff's sale. And you can see that over time, uh, this amount of sheriff sales has increased dramatically in the past around 10 years. So in the subprime mortgage crisis around 2008, we see a steep incline, even perhaps exponential, to peaking at 2017, where share sales were occurring at high, high rates. And there's a recent dip you'll notice in recent years, which is likely tied to the coronavirus pandemic. We'll all only note that this is likely transient due to the fact that the sheriff has, sheriff's office has put these sales online uh, vastly increasing the pool of potential buyers. So the urgency of this problem is enormous now. So as you can imagine, because vacant properties often are located in places where property owners can't pay their taxes, um, there are certain demographic patterns that you can discern uh, within these. And so when we look at certain demographic um, categories that include race, you'll see real clear patterns between neighborhoods that have a large amount of properties that are vacant and tax delinquent and those that aren't. And so here you can clearly see that among, when you compare neighbor, neighborhoods that are majority minority versus majority white, the majority minority neighborhoods contain a far greater share of vacant properties than those that are majority white. And this is also true in the median income category. So areas that lie below the median income line contain a far greater share of vacant properties than those that lie above. And what these two demographic categories effectively show is that when the city goes in and moves to foreclose and sell a vacant property via a sheriff's sale, that burden falls disproportionately on the shoulders of neighborhoods that are majority minority and that lie below the median income line, adding to the social urgency of this issue. Now, moving into kind of the third prong of our role that I described in the beginning, namely, what is the, the, design, the designing of the predictive algorithm for 
development across Philadelphia and share sales and which are at the greatest risk. We need to ask a threshold question, which is what kind of um, feature would we assign to represent development at large? And for that, we decided upon zoning permit applications. The reason for this is that on the full process, on the, the full spectrum of a development, given develop, real estate development, zoning permit applications occur fairly early in the planning and financing stage. And as a result, you can look at zoning permit applications as a kind of leading indicator of where development is likely to occur in the future and where developers are targeting for development. And this thesis is borne out by the fact that if you look over time, where zoning permit applications are being filed is a really close proxy for where development markets are hot in the future. And this clearly shows that in the heat map. So as we're modeling, we used a fishnet cell approach whereby we took all of Philadelphia and divided into 250 by 250 meter fishnet cells and looked at each cell individually in our model. And our model took in a whole host of different features that can be grouped into categories, including market activities, land availability, real estate demographics, and amenities. And so we took all these features, these data features, plugged it into our model, and we the output would ultimately be a possible zoning permit application uh, with the idea that that would represent where developers are most interested in developing. And ultimately, in our best model, um, what's very interesting and sort of validating of our thesis is that the feature that was the most influential in the model was actually the total vacant lots, which suggests that, in fact, developers are looking at areas where vacant lots are in greatest supply. Kind of makes sense. You want to develop in a place where there is abundant supply of land. And our model shows results that are fairly strong. So when we look at uh, the predicted development and uh, is it binary as well as continuous, you'll see that um, the results show that there's a fair, fair consistency between what is predicted and what is ultimately observed. And now I will take the time to show you, finally, our app. So for this project, we thought to ourselves, because it's such a public facing issue, we wanted to do two things. The first is, of course, to create the dashboard I described, which can show uh, properties and their likelihood of development and all of a very host of various data information. But also we wanted to give a kind of story for our members of the public, for policymakers, for anyone who might be interested in learning more about this problem. So I'll begin with the story map. And this story map essentially tells the story of exactly what I described in our presentation. We begin on a very particular parcel called La Pinquita. It used to be an old urban garden that sadly, in 2019, permanently closed. And from there, we kind of begin to weave this tale of how vacant lots in Philadelphia are under increasing threat of disposition and development because of this issue that I described today. Now to the interactive dashboard, you'll see here that we've mapped all of the vacant properties in Philadelphia and created a several filters that you can use to understand um, various information about each of these properties. So you can filter by which properties are tax delinquent. You can filter by which properties have been sold in a share of sale or are like or scheduled to be. And then most interestingly, and this is to the third prong again, we also look, can filter for which properties are likely to be developed. You can also do a point and click where we can show um, individual properties on the map and give various information like that, which include their development risk, whether they are tax delinquent, whether they are subject to a US bank lien, how much is actually due on their taxes and whether it was subject to share sale and the current owner. And then finally, of course, if you have a specific address in mind, you can type it in here, hit enter, and it'll tell you that individual property. And this is especially useful for 
members of the public, including property owners and neighbors who may know of a specific community asset in their neighborhood that they want to understand the risk of. And so between this interactive dashboard, as well as the story map, our hope is that we can both bring a greater awareness of this issue to the public, as well as to provide a useful tool for our client Philadelphia Legal Assistance to be able to understand what risks attend to specific properties as well as large neighborhoods and enable them to offer targeted assistance to that end. And so in closing, I would like to just offer a brief thank you to all of the people who have helped us throughout this process. That includes everyone at Philadelphia Legal Assistance, to members of the faculty at University of Pennsylvania, and of course, to Michael, Matt, and Jumbe, who is also a member of the MUSA faculty, and then lastly, to our classmates. So thank you all so much for your help in this project. Thank you. We have Max uh, on the Zoom with us. We weren't sure if he'd be able to join us. So we're glad to have Max here. Um, I'd like to give Philadelphia Legal Assistance the first. Uh, okay. Just, uh, oh, just sorry. Just, uh, I didn't mean to preempt you. There he is. Uh, Adrian, are you ready for questions? Yeah, just uh, before, if you want to explore the the tool is on this uh, tiny little button, not yeah, like this. Uh, and Max is over here, ready. Um, yeah, any questions? So, yeah. Great. I suppose I'll give Jonathan and Adam, and I, I don't know who else is joining us from the client side, uh, first opportunity for comments or questions. Well, just a comment. This, this is a fabulous work product. Um, and I, I don't know about the predictive analytics part, but the, uh, taking the, the stuff that we gave you and telling a story, uh, and especially with telling a story using images and uh, the maps and the uh, interactive nature of that, that site, uh, it's just fabulous. And, and I think this tool uh, with the uh, development interest and being able to click on uh, dots to see like what the properties are is going to help us in our, in our work. So thank you very much. It's an amazing class. Hi, this is Andrea. Um, I just want to chime in and say great job. Um, I think you made a really astute um, connection between zoning permits and development interests. That was a really smart move um, to be able to pull that sort of data and, and figure out exactly um, you know, how we can predict uh, development interest and then layer that on top of some of the other um, data points uh, such as delinquencies. Um, just being able to see this information laid out on the maps um, is extremely helpful and, and also validating in terms of um, our suspicion as to uh, where vacant uh, properties were going to be um, most at risk, um, and also tying in the, the racial and income demographic information, I think um, was, was really smart and very helpful. Um, you guys did a fantastic job, and I'm really looking forward to following up with you on you know, just some of the more uh, detailed uh, questions I'll have once I get a chance to poke around and, and work on the tool, um, but fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And just uh, as a comment, uh, sorry, uh, if, can you go to the uh, well, One of the requests that Andrea and the clients made at the uh, start of the semester was uh, whether we could uh, uh, make a version in Spanish for the tool because much of their, their clients are uh, uh, native Spanish speakers. So we have a version so that they can share with uh, a broader, broader uh, population. Beautiful, excellent, thank you. Uh, yes, John. So um, yeah, really a great presentation, both in look and feel and pacing, as well as substance. I just wanna um, uh, echo that last comment. I think the, the model that showed how zoning permits are a prediction of, uh, 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 lot distance is really valuable, but I want to push you all a lot further 
because I'm not philosophically, I'm not sure I buy into your argument, and this may be an issue with applying, which is to say that development is the problem. I mean, the implication of this is that if you sell a, 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 a big lot of salt that's developed, it's a problem. And, and, and I can see that outcome as being true, um, but I can also see um, appropriate development as being very good for the community. So um, uh, both to your client and uh, to you, I would urge you to go further and, and think about um, sort of a model that sort of says, okay, when is, when is development of a lot of vacant lots a problem, which is that it would result in the displacement of existing members of the community? Um, and when is it not a problem, uh, which is to say it provides needed housing opportunities for those members of the community. Um, so I, I'd encourage you to push this a little further in sort of thinking about outcomes uh, as they relate to the community and not just physical outcomes as they uh, relate to development. But I like the presentation. Thank you very much for the point. Uh, I know if Max wants to do that. I, I can, I can um, if I may, chime in to that. Um, no, I, I very much appreciate the, the feedback on that. Um, and it's, I have to give a nod to Michael, um, who has been uh, consistently um, reminding us of that um, and something that I think I attempted to, to toe the line on in the presentation, but perhaps didn't do um, as good of a job as I would have hoped. And that is to say that um, I think by no means is our, is our project uh, an attempt to cast development as the sole cause um, of the problem that we're perceiving. And in fact, I think what, we try, what we're trying to express is that um, it is for the select you know, hundreds upon hundreds of these vacant lots that are in active use by the community. Um, it is for those properties uh, that we are concerned about, but for the vast majority, as I, as I said, probably not enough times, the vast majority of vacant properties, as you've expressed, um, are underutilized. And uh, I think a sheriff sale and a development um, does restore vacant properties to uh, productive use. Um, but our concern is really with the you know, hundreds of properties that are already in what we would consider productive use, even on an economic, from an economic perspective, um, but that are potentially at risk of um, development otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I want to just nod to say I very much agree with that philosophy and that the, um, it is our point of view that um, vacant lots that are entirely underutilized and just abandoned and aren't being used by neighbors or the community um, are absolutely should be fair game for the market to to intervene on. Um, it is for those that are already already see kind of whether they're urban gardens or public parks for those properties um, we're kind of designing our tool. Thanks very much, Max. Give our team a hand. This is Fritz uh, Steiner. I, I put a comment in the um, in the chat. I realized you probably can't see it. it just the overall quality of um, the presentation, I thought, was really quite good. And you really did a fantastic job uh, employing photography to take um, you know, data and really humanize it and um, uh, give us a sense of uh, the people that you were talking about in the places that sh that's a really uh, superb job with the, the presentation. Thank you very much, Chris. I, I would echo that and I would say that one of the one of the strengths of all of our that all of our groups have tried to work on building through the year is taking these complex analyses and re reducing them to efficient communications. Um, you notice that there's a, a John made a remark to me that you know there are all these complex terms of technical jargon and statistics that um, you know might just really miss the mark if you include them in the way that you are presenting the information. So I think this this project in particular is a great example, and I, I want to give credit to all the team members and Max, who's a dual degree student with the law school. Um, I think that. Three of them have worked very, very hard to make this into almost a journalistic project. So thanks again to Dean Snyder. Thank you for this presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you.
Hoffman from El Paso for being uh, such a wonderful client and uh, really being um, there for every step of the process in shaping the project that you're about to see. So um, let me turn it over to our, our last group. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me all right? <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'm Jenna, and I'm joined by my teammates, Kristen and Susan. And for our project, we reimagined road repair and the process for doing so by developing a predictive model and accompanying web application to help the Capital Improvements Department in El Paso, Texas, make more informed decisions when allocating where and how to distribute capital improvement funds across road repair projects. So first, we'd like to give a special thanks, echoing Michael, um, to Alex Hoffman at the Capital Improvements Department for working with us on our project and being so enthusiastic about propelling this work forward. Uh, we'd also like to thank MUSA faculty members Michael, Matt, and Jumbe for their support in advising our project, as well as our classmates. And of course, to Ken Seif, who set up this academic framework for us to be able to apply uh, data science to urban challenges. So this is our roadmap uh, <laughs> for today. We'll be starting with some context and introducing our use case. Then we'll dive into some exploratory data analysis, move on to discuss our modeling, and then finally end with our uh, app development and a little demo. So we're going to start with our use case. But before we get too much into the details, we'd like to give some context to everyone in the room and on Zoom about where El Paso is to frame our use case. So El Paso, Texas is a city within the greater county of El Paso, uh, the headquarters of Fort Bliss, which is one of the largest military bases in the world sits nearby. And the city is located on the westernmost tip of the state, uh, bordering the state of New Mexico to the north and the west, and then the Mexican border and Ciudad Juarez to the south. So El Paso has been experiencing a lot of growth and revitalization over the past decade. Uh, the city passed a comprehensive plan back in 2012 and this really revamped the zoning laws and spread a lot of public and private investment projects across the city. Uh, specifically, there was a new minor league baseball stadium, uh, repairs to international bridges, um, adaptive reuse of historic buildings, and the designation of a downtown arts district. So, but with more visitors and commuters and daily travelers around the city comes increased pressure on road infrastructure. So the city of El Paso's Capital Improvements Department wants to improve their system for deciding where and how to allocate their capital improvement funds for road repair projects. Presently, this is influenced primarily by a PCI or Pavement Conditions Index score that's assigned to each road segment across the city. So Alex informed us that there is an upcoming budget meeting and they are receiving a bond package and will be needing to decide exactly how much of this to devote to infrastructure improvements. So this is a concrete opportunity for them to use our project to advocate for allocating more of that money towards pavement repair and really show how their choices can impact the community proactively. So stepping back for a moment, what exactly is this PCI? Uh, PCIs are based off of factors such as presence of potholes, uh, bumps in the road, cracks, et cetera. And the index ranges qualitatively from failing to good or quantitatively zero to 100. And typically, as you can see on the chart, there's a significant drop in condition of a road after a certain amount of time. So in El Paso, PCI scores uh, are the primary driver for the decision making, 
But a lot of the decisions are still ad hoc. As we talked to Alex, it seems some constituents may raise concerns about certain roads in a town hall meeting. The department would look at their PCI score, and if it's below a certain threshold, then they'll add it to the list of uh, projects to, to repair. So this is a very reactive process, and as mentioned, they would like to make this more proactive. So PCI was most recently generated for El Paso back in 2018 by a contractor who conducted a proprietary digital image scan of all the city's roads. This chart depicts the counts of road segments by their PCI score. And you can see that roads in El Paso are typically in the good condition, fair to good condition. There's a spike in the graph around the 40 to 55 range, which actually equates to the very poor or poor rating on the scale. But also PCI doesn't tell the whole story about what's going on with roads in El Paso. And the city wants to explore other factors that may drive a new prioritization strategy. So this leads to our project's two main objectives. We first have the PCI predictive model, where we'll we use historical data and features to predict PCI score for 2021. The second part is the web app we've created, the El Paso Road Viewer, or better known as the EPRV, as we're calling it. Uh, in the app, we incorporate our predicted 2021 PCI score, but it's just one piece of the resource allocation and prioritization puzzle. And a bit later in the presentation, we'll be talking about these other factors that we incorporated in our app development. So I'd like to hand it off to Kristen to talk about some of our exploratory data analysis. Thanks, Jenna. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar, this is this is a general overview of our uh, how we built the predictive model, and I'll be talking about the data cleaning and processing how we engineered some of the features that will eventually serve as the input for the model. When we thought about what features we wanted to include, it, we thought about what factors can contribute to the overall wear and tear of a road in its given lifetime, and we categorized those things into these three groups. The first is road conditions or the physical properties of the road. The second is environmental conditions or any sort of aspect of the surrounding area that could influence the road's condition. So whether or not a road is nearby water, or if these are roads that people are using to get to like a popular shopping area or to places of work. And then lastly, the road network, which describes how the individual road and road segments interact with one another. And so now here are some of these features that we hypothesized would have a strong relationship with PCI score. And we'll be going through each of them on the next few slides. So first up, potholes. We've all probably gone over one of these at some point in our life. We know that they can be pretty dangerous. The data in this chart shows that in El Paso, there are over 5,000 potholes on the roads each year since 2016. Our client hinted pretty heavily that the presence of potholes can significantly decrease the PCI score. So we definitely wanted to include this data in our model. To do that, we calculated how many potholes were present per foot on each road segment. And this ended up not being our most important feature, but it was still pretty significant, so we did include it in the model. The next hypothesis we had was that land use would heavily influence PCI score. For the non-city planners in the room, land use prescribes how the area will be used in the future. So you can see in this map that a lot of El Paso is zoned for single-family housing, as well as some retail zoning downtown, which is in the southern part of the shape. Um, and this also ended up being pretty significant in the model. Lastly, we figured if a road is really close to a major intersection, it's likely to be used more often. And so in order to capture that in our model, we calculated the distance of each road segment to, each, to its, major, its nearest major intersection and included those distances in the model. They ended up performing really well. And so to go along with that, we also calculated the distance of each road segment to a major arterial, so something like a highway or a road with class major. And this also helped our model improve a lot as well. Now I'll hand the mic over to Susan to talk about our modeling approach. Thank you, Kirsty. Now let me help you walk through the modeling part of our project. After feature engineering, we split our data into a training and test set. And we input our training set into different kinds of models to predict the PCI scores. Then we calculate the model errors by subtracting the actual PCI scores. In the table below, it shows the models we use with their mean absolute percent error. And as you can see, the random forest performs the best. Here we take a closer look at the error distributions of our random forest model. You can see that the errors 
uh, tend to cluster tightly around zeros, which indicates that there are little to few differences in predicted PPI, and these are great results. To visualize the same error over space, we summarize the pre predictions by census check, and we can see a clear pattern that the census track with high absolute errors tend to cluster under the uh, Interstate 10 highway, which cut through the city. And this shows that there is a sense of spatial inequity in our model accuracy that we need to be aware of. In fact, our client informed us that there has been historic disinvestment in the areas below the Interstate 10. And this might lead to uh, poor data collection or biased data collection, which might be the root of those higher absolute errors there. After evaluating the model with training and test set, we apply it to the 2021 data to make PCI predictions for the year 2021. And here we selected two regions to, our, to show our prediction results. The first is downtown El Paso, and the second is the neighborhood called Las Terras in the northeast corner of the city. As you can see, in downtown El Paso, there are some road segments with low PCI scores and are in bad condition. While most of the road segments in Las Terras neighborhood are in pretty good condition with a higher PCI score. Since we do not have the actual 2021 PCI scores to calculate errors with, we selected some road segments from the city and uh, take a look at the actual road conditions from the Google, uh, Google Maps Street View. As you can see, the road segments, uh, the road surface from Central Grande Drive and Central Drive are smooth and flat and in similarly good condition as we predicted. And in the contrast, you can see that uh, you can easily spot the potholes and cracks from uh, Park Street Drive and Rosinante Road that indicates the road need to be repaired. This shows uh, this road conditions align with our model predictions, which shows the, our, uh, the power of our model to create a more proactive decision-making process and help the city to carry out uh, to carry out the scenario planning process with the predicted features. But our model is not always perfect. So it is important for us to consider the trade-offs between over-prediction and under-prediction of the PCI scores and what this means for the El Paso Capital Improvement Department. When the PCI scores are over-predicted, which means the predicted scores are actually uh, better than the actual conditions, this might lead to some roads need to be repaired, but does not show up on the list of the department. But the department will have a shorter list of projects which will save their money and time. When PCI scores are underpredicted, the department will have a longer list of projects, but, the, but some road segments will get a chance to be attended to earlier before the situation gets worse. And this in the long run will save the department's money as well. So we believe that under predictions of PCIs is better. However, just keep in mind, large errors, which means 15 or more, are the only ones that will actually change the rating of the road segments according to the rating scale shown on the left. And when we look at the error distribution histogram, we can see that, that there are only a few of those large errors there. So our road segments are not misclassified that dramatically. Now let's welcome Christine back to the web app application part. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Okay, so we're moving on to the second part of our project. And just as a reminder, a goal of this project is to bring in data into the decision-making process for the Capital Improvements Department, other than just PCI. The department has sent out a community survey earlier this year where they learned that residents most value equity, safety, traffic congestion, and flood risk when thinking about how to improve their city's road infrastructure. So we wrangle even more data to create our tool, the El Paso Road Year. The El Paso Road Year, which we're calling EPRB. So welcome to EPRB. Got this fun pop up with some information and then some instructions on the left on how to navigate the page. Um, but we really want to walk through the four main functions of the tool that we built. The first being the PCI slider. The default is set to 55, which is the rating for poor on that scale. 
the number that's shown above the slider is the upper threshold for the filter. So in its default view, the map will show all roads with the score 55 and below. Moving down, there are the four layers from the survey that we talked about earlier so that users can analyze the roads under different planning content. In the upper right hand corner, there's a search bar. We've all seen one of these before. So you can look up your street name and see what the road details are or a landmark. In this case, we're using the El Paso Museum of Art as an example and see what road segments are nearby. And then once you're zoomed in, you can click on a road segment, a little pop up window will show up. And it has further details that include the street name, the 2021 PCI score that's from our predicted model the street class, the planning area, and then the city district. So overall, the El Paso Road Viewer helps increase transparency with the decision-making process. It offers quick analysis, and it brings in, again, data other than just PCI. But to prove it to you all, we have a little scenario plan. So let's pretend that I'm Alex. I'm our client and a planner in the Capital Improvements Department. I have this big budget meeting coming up where the city is discussing how to improve traffic congestion downtown. I bring this tool to the meeting and I can toggle on the congestion layer. I can see which roads fall into these darkest areas of orange, which are areas of high traffic congestion. But I know that we have a limited budget, so I want to limit and just see the roads that are being really poorly. So I can lower the slider down to 40 or 45 and see those roads there. And now I can quickly propose that the roads that overlap with this darkest orange getting repaired would help improve traffic congestion downtown. Everyone can see how I arrived at that decision pretty quickly, and we can move on with our days because you all agree with me, you love it, I'm a hero. So now I can go to my next meeting, that's about stormwater infrastructure, and do the same thing with the high flood risk layer. I can see which areas are at risk for high flooding, Propose that fixing these roads would help improve our stormwater infrastructure. And again, I'm a hero and I can go home and become my lunch. <laughs> so that's how the El Paso Road Viewer works. Um, we've had a really great time building this tool this semester, learning all about roads in Texas. We can't thank Alex enough for all his support and collaboration. And we just want to thank our instructors again, Matt, Michael, and Jembe for all their help this semester. And thank you everyone for listening. Okay, I'll, I'll give um, our client who's on Zoom the opportunity to have the floor if you'd like. Alex, are you there? Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. And I apologize that my video is not on. I'm actually uh, sitting in city council right now, getting ready to actually present the fact that we're gonna have this tool to help us with our project selection process today. So that was one of the things I think that was really exciting about this project is the immediate opportunity for implementation. So I just really want to thank the three of you uh, for the tremendous work. I was really impressed, especially when you were showing, you know, how, how accurate the predictive tool was. And so we're really excited to use it and um, really looking forward to being able to share with you the results that come about as, as a result of your hard work. So thank you very much. And we, we really appreciate it. Can't, can't state it enough. Thank you, Alex. Are there questions from the room or from the Zoom audience? Uh, John. Well, first of all, I just want to say that um, the goal of this program and these types of efforts is to add value to the uh, planning or political or governance decision making process. That's always the goal. And I, I, can never, I can't recall seeing an application that adds as much value to the decision making process as this one. Um, I, I, I think that it's, I, I, I don't usually use the term genius, but it's genius in terms of uh, usability. I, I think that the way the app works in terms of the PCI sliders and turning on the four, not 100, but just four <laughs> criteria and being able to interactively do that is, is, is absolutely brilliant. But more than just being brilliant, is absolutely useful. And I can see a lot. I can see Alex. I can't see him, but I can imagine he's going to show this, and it's going to blow people away. And, and you all deserve just incredible credit. But I want to point out uh, one other thing, which is this is a a, a real you've threaded a really difficult needle here, 
uh, in my view, because I, I think the inputs into your model are somewhat questionable. Um, the PCI measure, which you said is proprietary, and which and when they, whenever somebody says proprietary, uh, to me, I, there, I think there's a cinnamon that says uh, underdeveloped, um, <laughs> because if it was properly developed, it wouldn't be proprietary, maybe. Um, that's not always true. Uh, so you've got this measure that's your dependent variable that you're not sure about. You've also got a set of independent variables, which I assume are a function of the data availability and not what your preferences are. Because if I were doing this, I would want the volume to capacity ratios on each link, which is the actual congestion and utilization level, because that's by far the best predictor that of truck traffic um, <laughs> deterioration. You didn't have that. So you've got inputs that are, you know, a little squirrely. Uh, and yet, I, I think it's just a, a fabulous job. You bring them together and don't, and use them in a way that is well done and well justified. As I said, adds an incredible amount of value. So, uh, uh, just congratulations for well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the room before we close? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, congratulations to you all. Let's have a round of applause for all of our students who did a wonderful job all semester. Um, so that's it. The semester's over. You did it. Um, I think it's a good time to reflect on what's been accomplished here, not just in this class, but over the course of the whole year, or for some of you, your whole careers here at Penn. And um, I think we talk a lot about these models where it's like, okay, they're, they're path dependent, right? They don't deal well with emergence, right? So could we have predicted where you are right now based on where you were uh, on the 3rd of September when we stood in this room for the first time? I don't think so. Um, so that's, it's quite a pleasure to go on that uh, journey of transformation with you. And um, I'm always very nervous, but very pleased uh, at how things go, because I know probably around October or something, you're so frustrated with Matt and I and the things that we're making you do that seem so arbitrary and stuff doesn't work. And what are we even doing here? And then at some point, things kind of come around. And then we get to a point where we're talking to you about your projects and you ask us a question, we say, you, you tell me, you're the expert, right? So that's where you are now, you're the experts and you've demonstrated your ability to go out there in the workplace um, or in your academic career, whatever the case may be, and do this kind of work. Um, I want to thank uh, Matt for um, going with us on this journey all year. Um, it's been a very difficult year, uh, learning how to go to school back in person. Um, and uh, I, I mean, it, I, I cannot overstate how much we, we miss our friend Ken. Um, and uh, this is our first year doing this without him. And it was really hard, but I thought at so many points over the course of the year, he would have loved this stuff. You know, I mean, every time uh, the side lots group was presenting, I just thought, man, oh man, he would love this. <laughs> so I'm sure wherever he is, he's pretty proud of you. And uh, I'm glad that we're all thinking of him. Um, and uh, congratulations to you all. You've earned it. You're all our colleagues now and you're not students. So we look forward to going and celebrating with you. Congratulations. Thank you.